name is Darcy Dumont, and I'm on the, um, the steering committee of Climate Action Now. I'm a member of Mother's Out Front, and I'm uh, a new district councilor from District 5 in Amherst in our, our new town council. Um, I want to thank MCAN uh, and the Hitchcock Center and uh, Mother's Out Front and Climate Action Now for sponsoring this uh, event uh, so that we can support net zero construction of new buildings in order to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and avert a worst case scenario for uh, climate change. Um, this is important on a number of levels and part of our job is to help folks, including government officials, to wrap their heads around the fact that our climate crisis won't be solved by simply uh, deploying renewable energy. That deployment has to be complemented across the board with making our buildings energy efficient, starting with new construction. You're probably aware that Amherst is the first town to pass a zero energy bylaw requiring that new town buildings be zero energy. Here, um, who worked on that bylaw? You could raise your hands if you worked on that zero energy bylaw. Um, since I joined the town council, we've established an energy and climate action committee, which I hope will take a leadership role in formulating some more bold policy in general, and in recommending our adoption of Community Choice Energy 3.0. So if any of you are interested in either joining the new energy committee if you're from Amherst and I have, there's information on the table about doing that and there's also information about community choice energy but so um, uh, we have some stellar speakers today who are better building and climate heroes and we're starting with Clinton Zondervan on the end who uh, is a tech entrepreneur nonprofit leader and community activist currently serving his first term on the Cambridge City Council is it your first term? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> in 2013, he co-authored the Net Zero Zoning Petition that led the, to the city's groundbreaking Net Zero Action Plan, adopted in 2015 to get Cambridge's climate pollution from buildings down to zero. Quentin. All right. I'm trying to bring up my speaker now. Not that one. Um, how are we doing the I'm doing it. <laughs> All right. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for being here. Happy to share with you guys what uh, we were able to do in, in Cambridge. So back in 2013, myself and uh, now State Rep Mike Connolly filed the Net Zero Zoning Petition along with John Pitkin and with the support of many uh, residents. And that led to the adoption of the Net Zero Action Plan in 2015 by the Cambridge City Council. We have a full-time Net Zero Planner who's implementing our plan and reports on it annually. And one of the first things they did was to create a nice infographic, which is too small for you to see, so I've amplified different sections of it so we can talk it through. But it's been a really great tool to help people understand net zero, what, what does it mean and, and why is it important? And, and really, in Cambridge, we, we are the fifth densest city in the country with a population of 100,000 uh, people. So we have a lot of buildings. And as a result, 80% of our emissions comes from buildings because our transportation is relatively efficient, uh, but our buildings are still largely not. And of course, we're adding a lot of new buildings including some very high energy intensity uh, buildings like biomass. So we decided back in 2013 that this was not really a, a sustainable path, that we would just keep adding buildings that were not energy efficient, increasing our emissions, even though we were trying to reduce our emissions. So that's where the, the Net Zero Action Plan came from. <coughs> so, our goal was, was 25 years uh, of planning, and, and as you'll see, it's not actually uh, zero. <laughs> so, so by 2040, we will have, the goal is to achieve a 70% reduction. And then, we don't really know what happens after that, but hopefully if we're you know, on the right trajectory, we'll, we'll get all the way there. And so at this 
shows is the, the yellow line is the uh, RPS as it was back in 2015. Hopefully that will get a little steeper now. And then the green line is, is the energy efficiency and energy reductions that we would need to, uh, to achieve even as we're adding new buildings. So we basically look at it as the reduce, reuse, recycle for building energy, right? So reduce the energy that you need to operate the building, increase the efficiency of the building, and then use renewable energy for the rest. It's relatively straightforward, um, difficult to put into practice. <laughs> so this is the rest of the infographic, and we have a, a whole Gantt chart with all the different um, legislative pieces that we need to achieve. I'm just going to give you some of the some of the highlights that we're working on. So we have a building energy use and disclosure ordinance that requires large buildings to report their energy use and then to disclose it publicly so we're able to see how the buildings are performing and then eventually we can start to put some requirements on, on the buildings and say you know it has to be above a certain performance level uh, otherwise you have to remediate or pay into a fund or something. Um, we are defining net zero performance standards for our buildings so the municipal buildings are going new construction only uh, will be net zero by 2020. And, and in fact, we are already building net zero ready uh, in our municipal buildings. So we are building a new school right now. It's a replacement uh, of the school that my kids happen to go to. And that building will have no on-site fossil fuel consumption. So it is ready to go as soon as we are able to get 100% renewable uh, electricity to supply. Um, and then small residential, so mostly individual uh, homes or triple deckers, have to be net zero by 2022. Again, this is new construction in Cambridge. And then larger commercial buildings and, and large residential by 25. And then the biolabs get to go last, so they're 2030. Um, so that's the, the net zero standards that we're developing. We're also developing zoning incentives. We're updating our green building ordinance, which currently requires lead silver for buildings 25,000 square foot and, and larger. We're updating that to lead gold as the requirement. And I will say that most buildings that big in Cambridge built today are already lead gold by default. Um, we're also working on a solar requirement. Uh, Watertown just passed a solar requirement, and of course the state uh, is working on one, so we're looking at how we can build on those successes. And then to get around the code preemption issues, we're looking at net zero as a performance standard rather than a design standard so that we can uh, impose those requirements without running afoul of our state. So the last thing is um, actually on the City Council agenda for Monday, and this is me trying to get my fellow councilors to vote for the uh, International Energy Code. So hopefully they will uh, pass this resolution <laughs> and we'll have to figure out a way to select eight councilors out of nine. <laughs> Somebody will not get the vote. Um, but, you know, I think it's a great opportunity to uh, get our municipal governments to participate in, in these decisions. And um, I can actually read some of the text for you if that helps. So, whereas the Metropolitan Area Planning Commission is partnering with Energy Efficiency Code Coalition, the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnership Massachusetts Climate Action Network and the Sierra Club Massachusetts chapter to encourage Massachusetts municipalities to register to vote and have a voice in the creation of a more energy efficient and climate smart 2021 International Energy Conservation Code. And has some more details. It says ordered that the city council designate a city councilor, that will be me, um, to coordinate the registering of up to eight councilors as voters 
and be further ordered that the city council authorize this designee to pay the $240 fee and register the city council as a government member for the city of Cambridge by March 29, 2019. And it's important to note that our staff, our city staff, is, are, are already registering to vote, and they can do that separately. So under, the, under these rules, the town council or the city council is a separate government member that can register separately from the departments and can also have, uh, in our case, up to eight votes because we're between 100,000 and 150,000 population. So that's my presentation, <coughs> very quick overview on Cambridge Net Zero and happy to take questions. We'll save it for after everyone presents, if that's okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. So next up is Darren Port. He is a Buildings and Community Solutions Manager at Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnerships. He works on developing and implementing policy strategies for the advancement of the Northeast region's adoption of progressive building energy codes. And additionally, Darren advocates for policies to rate and disclose building energy performance. Darren. Yeah, thanks. So let's see if I can try this without the mic. If, it, if I drop off, you can, you can let me know. <coughs> I need a mic for the, okay, no problem. So uh, who's doing the slides? I am. Is that done? Yeah. Great, thanks. You can go to the next slide. Uh, so I'm with the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnerships, otherwise known as NEEP. Uh, we uh, work uh, throughout the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic region, all 13 states from D.C. to Maine, including West Virginia, we work with all the state energy offices, getting them to adopt the latest building energy codes and zero energy uh, policies. We have uh, a goal of all new construction in all of our 13 states by 2030 and the decarbonization of the grid and all existing buildings by 2050. Go ahead. So if anyone hasn't seen energy codes, uh, <laughs> uh, no, not quite. It's only in New Jersey. It's, it's, uh, you can do the next. Uh, so, so why energy codes and why energy uh, efficiency standards? Many of these are, are, are kind of straightforward and you'll recognize, of course, the energy code uh, saves dollars. It makes a building more uh, energy efficient, saving the occupants dollars. Uh, stimulates the economy because of those dollars that are being saved are going back into the local economy. Creates jobs because of those new services uh, and new technologies to be integrated into an energy efficient building. Uh, the less energy being used by our buildings, the less being used uh, by the grid. Uh, the energy code helps consumers make good decisions. Uh, it helps uh, uh, reliability and resiliency. So if you have a building that's well insulated uh, with the large swing of temperatures that we now see in our everyday climate, uh, you're more comfortable in that building. So these are some of the things that the Energy Code uh, assures uh, as well as, as keeping uh, buildings safe. Uh, and the Energy Code is actually the only code that pays for itself. Uh, all the other codes are really cost center and you're seeing a return on your investment by implementing Uh, so what I'd like to do today is talk a little bit uh, about how codes are made on the national level, and then we'll talk a little bit about what happens in Massachusetts. Uh, so the energy code on the national level currently is a 2018 International Energy Conservation Code, which is both for residential and commercial. Uh, and then there's ASHRAE code on the commercial side. The energy code, the national energy code, every three years uh, it's revised. So there was the 18, and now currently we're beginning work on the 2021. There'll be a 2024, 27, 2030, and so forth. Uh, it's supposed to increase in efficiency every year. However, uh, it really hasn't between 12 and 15, at least on the residential side. Uh, maybe, <coughs> maybe a 1%. Uh, increase. Well, the DOE has not come out with the determination yet on the residential side. On the commercial side, we know we've gained some efficiency. Uh, it's the minimum efficiency standards for buildings. 
Uh, it covers everything from thermal envelope uh, to windows, heating, lighting, uh, and it's customizable for each climate zone. So depending where you are in the country, there is different provisions that you have to use within the code. The energy code is also the least enforced code, and perhaps is maybe the most controversial code. And it is the least enforced and most controversial because most code officials don't see the energy code as a life safety code. They don't see the code as preserving life. We see it differently than it does because it prevents mold, it prevents fire spread because you have a tighter building, and a number of different reasons, the resiliency and so forth. So we consider the energy code certainly a life safety code. Uh, so the energy code is part of a family of codes, the ICC family of codes. Uh, basically, if it exists, there's a code for it. And if there isn't a code, there's a standard for it. Uh, so we're just talking about the energy code here today. And you can see there's plumbing, property maintenance, zoning, sewage disposal. Again, you name it, there's a code for it. Uh, so how are the codes developed? As I said earlier, uh, every three years, the, the codes are revised. Uh, you can make a proposal, anyone can make a proposal to the International Code Council for a code change, uh, either a strengthening or a weakening amendment. Uh, we prefer strengthening amendments, of course. Uh, but you can propose anything you want, anybody. You can get together uh, as the city of Amherst and submit a code change proposal or as an individual. Then there's multiple hearings. There are usually two, uh, two hearings per code cycle. Uh, you can go and testify and defend your proposal. Uh, the first hearing is in front of a committee that votes on the proposals. The second uh, is when the code officials or the voting members of the ICC get to, uh, to make their arguments uh, about the code. Uh, membership is reserved for government employees, so Quentin just uh, reviewed that uh, Cambridge is uh, putting out this uh, uh, memorandum, I guess? Or, uh, Resolution. Right, uh, so to get their folks to, to vote. Uh, and then once the codes are developed on a national level, they can be uh, adopted on the local level. And each <laughs> state does it differently. Some states, it's a uniform construction code. Everybody within that state has to do the same thing. Other states, the state might adopt the code, but then it's up to each individual municipality within the state to adopt it. So it varies from state to state uh, throughout the US. So 2021, if anybody wants to jump in and get involved, uh, the proposals for the 2021 ICC come out uh, March 4th, so you can get to review all of the proposals. You can come to Albuquerque the end of April. Uh, I'll be there, we can hang out and have a beer together. Uh, I'm actually serving on the uh, International Green uh, Construction Code Committee. So some of the proposals, uh, there's gonna be a zero energy appendix that's gonna be proposed uh, for inclusion in 2021. The energy advocates nationally are, are looking for a 10 to 15% increase in efficiency for the 2021. Uh, and that's really important that we get an increase in efficiency uh, in this round since there wasn't much between the 12 uh, and the 15. So how does it work in Massachusetts? Uh, there's the uh, of Building Regulations and Standards, otherwise known as the BBRS. Uh, we all have heard them. They are responsible for the adoption of codes, not just the energy code, but all of the codes and standards for the state of Massachusetts. Uh, they adopt the energy code in collaboration with the DOER, the Division of Energy Resources. Uh, the BBRS is 11 members, nine of which are appointed by the governor. Uh, and then there's advisory committees. So there's an energy advisory committee, uh, structural, geotechnical, amusements. Uh, that's a, yes. probably the funnest uh, committee I imagine. Uh, go out to amusement parks. Um, and they have a rule that uh, within one year of their national code coming out, uh, the state of Massachusetts has to adopt the energy code. So it's an interesting phenomenon we see happen in Massachusetts where from time to time, or actually the past two cycles, uh, the 18 and the 15 in Massachusetts, the state just adopted the energy code. Uh, still exceeded the year, but in order to comply with the law, 
but also to comply with some national rating systems, the state usually adopts the energy code first, and then we'll go back and adopt the other I codes, uh, which the state adopts. Uh, the Office of Public Safety and Inspections, they're the folks that implement the codes, so the VBRS adopts them, uh, and then the OPSI uh, implements them, and they license the building officials and the code inspectors. Uh, we're currently on the Massachusetts 9th edition, which became effective in October 2017. Uh, that's 2015 IACC, uh, and some components of ASHRAE for, for commercial buildings. Uh, and then we have a stretch code in Massachusetts. We were the first state in the country to have the stretch code uh, back in 2009. Uh, the stretch code is one of the five criteria for the Green Communities Program. Uh, and what else can I say? Uh, so, the for, on the residential side, the stretch code is complying with the performance path. So, there's three different uh, avenues of compliance for the residential energy code, uh, and the stretch code calls out compliance with one of those three. On the commercial side, uh, buildings have to be 10% better than the commercial code, uh, and unfortunately, existing buildings aren't at all. So we're in a situation now, next month, uh, March 12th, the VBRS guarantees they're going to vote on the adoption of the 2018. They've now postponed it to uh, two meetings, and so this will be the third, so hopefully we'll see it. When that happens, the base code, so the adopted code, the 2018 IACC, uh, will actually be on par or, or stronger than the stretch code. Uh, there's no provision in Massachusetts state law that says when the new stretch code has to be adopted. And DOER is saying to us it's going to take perhaps up to a year to get a new <coughs> stretch code. So for that entire year, towns that are green, particularly green communities towns, uh, are going to be in a state of limbo. What are they going to do? So it says the performance path for residential, but that's the performance path of the 2015. The performance path of the 18 is obviously stronger. It's 10% better than ASHRAE 13. We're about to adopt 16. Uh, so we'll see if they come out with an advisory statement uh, or exactly what uh, will happen in terms of the So NEEP has an uh, initiative called MAZE. Uh, it's Massachusetts Achieving Zero Energy. Uh, we have a couple of goals, uh, and that is that the state of Massachusetts they adopt a, uh, a, a stretch code that's stronger than base, uh, and preferably a zero energy stretch code. Uh, and then we want to see the state make a commitment to get all construction uh, to zero energy by 2030 or earlier, as well as we want to see all schools built in the state uh, to be zero energy. Uh, so that's the maze initiative and uh, you can check out our website in a couple of weeks we'll, we'll have the um, full details of what maze looks like uh, and just a couple of resources uh, community action planning for energy efficiency otherwise known as kp uh, this is a tool where small to medium-sized communities can go in uh, log on and do a worksheet and it'll generate uh, suggestions for your municipality on how to save energy uh, and then it'll also give you access to all kinds of resources about energy efficiency. There's everything from street lighting to wastewater treatment, sewer treatment plant efficiencies, uh, and any number of other initiatives. Uh, and then one of our latest papers, Building Energy Codes for a Carbon Constrained Era. Uh, this talks all about building codes uh, throughout, uh, building energy codes throughout the region uh, and offers uh, a lot of interesting suggestions and details for the implementation and adoption of the energy code to get to zero energy and the de decarbonization of buildings. Uh, and that's all. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yep. <laughs> all right. So organizer at Mass Climate Action Network. She's passionate about working with advocates in communities across Massachusetts to make building codes more efficient, more equitable, and safer for everyone.
Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here today. Um, thank you to all of our panelists and the Hitchcock Center for hosting us. Um, so like Darcy said, my name is Rebecca Winter knox and I'm working on our Building Codes campaign at Mass Climate Action Network. So to give a brief introduction, um, MCAN was founded in 2000, and we are a learning network of chapters in cities and towns across Massachusetts, um, working to fight climate change on the local level by implementing clean energy solutions in our communities. And we would love to welcome a local group um, if that you're part of, if you would like to join our network. Um, and we also work to give advocates across Massachusetts a voice on the local and the state level, um, which is really what our Better Building Codes campaign is all about. It's about how we can um, organize to reform building codes, not just for our communities, but for the entire state and beyond. Okay, so why do we need better building codes? You may wonder. Uh, the answer is really simple. Like Quentin said, um, and Darren also said, buildings are a major contributor to climate change. Um, in Massachusetts, they're responsible for over half of all of our energy consumption and over 40% of our carbon pollution. But that also means that by, by addressing the sort of um, way that we build buildings, we're taking a really big step to fight climate change um, <coughs> with, for not that much effort. So it's a really important thing to be engaged on. Okay, so I'll just briefly recap um, what Darren introduced for us in a lot more detail. So in Massachusetts, the Board of Building Regulation and Standards um, promulgates building codes, and unlike in other states, we really only have two building codes in Massachusetts. So we have the base code, which is the floor for all new construction, and then we have the stretch code, which is the ceiling for all construction um, in communities that have passed the stretch code. And MCAN's campaign is trying to improve buildings um, by addressing both the base code and the stretch code. So how do we do that? Um, I'm gonna start by talking about how we can improve the base code. And the way to, do, to improve the base code is to improve the International Energy Conservation Code that Darren gave us a great introduction to. Okay, so just to sort of hit home again at what Darren was saying, um, we can see that there have been really significant energy efficient gains in the 20, um, sorry, in the International Energy Conservation Code in the past. Um, so you can see that there is a path to make big gains in terms of efficiency, but in the last two code cycles, we've really plateaued. Um, 2018 isn't on this chart, but if it were, it would be a zero to one percent gain in terms of efficiency. Um, and a lot of that is due to the fact that not many people are registered to vote on what the code looks like, and the folks that are registered to vote tend to be anti-efficiency. So we're thinking about building inspectors and code officials and not climate champions who are interested in improving the ways that we build buildings. Um, so while Massachusetts is required to pass the latest version of, this, of the base code, um, it doesn't really make a difference whether we have the 2015 or the 2018 code if there isn't an actual boost in efficiency between the two codes. So how does it actually work to change the code? Um, Darren gave us a great overview of what it looks like on the national level. So there's a national process um, of submitting amendments and then reviewing them to update the existing code, but it's ultimately in the power of local municipal officials to determine what the, the newest version of the International Energy Conservation Code looks like. Um, so thinking about who is able to register to actually vote on the code, um, we have the definition here from the International Code Council, which is any governmental unit, department, or agency engaged in the administration, formulation, or enforcement of laws, ordinances, rules, regulations relating to the public health, safety, and welfare. So a very broad definition. Um, and like I said, in the past, the people who have taken the time um, to register have mostly been folks who are building inspectors, um, people who work directly with the code, and not so much um, for efficiency officials. And a lot of that has simply also been because they don't know that they have the power to register, <coughs> um, which is what our campaign is hoping to educate and empower folks to do. Um, you can also see um, the number of votes is determined by the population size of municipality. So like Quinton mentioned, in Cambridge, because they have between 50,000 and 150,000 residents, 
um, any entity that registers to vote on this new code um, would get to have eight votes, and they would pay $240 um, to register to do so. But the really great thing about this is that, like also what Quinton said, uh, that doesn't mean that just one entity can register to vote. So the Cambridge City Council can register to vote, but so can the planning department, so could the health board, um, so could any other body that meets this definition um, and is chartered by the municipality. So here is a quick list of the kinds of proficiency folks that we're looking to get registered to vote on the IECC. Um, and we also have handouts in the front that you can definitely look at on your way out that sums this up. But it can be members of city councils, um, select boards, planning department, city and town managers, um, energy managers, sustainability directors, and even in some towns, um, energy commissions that were chartered by the town are eligible to actually vote on the code. Yes. And this is a statistic that really boggled my mind when I first saw it, which is that Massachusetts alone has thousands of eligible officials, but during the last code cycle, only about 400 officials across the country voted on the International Energy Conservation Code. So that is just kind of an astonishing number, that if we can get just a fraction of the eligible folks in Massachusetts and make sure that they're pro-efficiency folks, <laughs> we can literally change the way that buildings are built, not just in Massachusetts, but actually across the country. So here uh, are some key dates, and this is also in the handout that I recommend you guys snag. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the biggest date coming up is March 29th, which is the deadline for a, a governmental member or that's a department or entity to register with the International Code Council. And then they actually have until September 23rd to um, sort of fill up the roster. So if Quentin registers by March 29th, he has until September 23rd to add um, seven other city councilors to vote as members of the Cambridge City Council. And then the voting actually takes place over a two-week code, uh, sorry, voting cycle in November. And before then, we're going to be circulating uh, pro-efficiency voting guidelines that we're, we'll be working on with our national partners. So just basic pro-efficiency, anti-efficiency, um, a structure of like which way we can vote to make sure that we're voting on the right things. So next steps for our base code campaign are to stay engaged, um, connect with other advocates in your communities, which we are happy to help you make these connections. Um, we're also working with Sierra Club and the Metropolitan Area Planning Council and NEEP on this campaign. Um, and MAPC is actually offering um, half hour coaching sessions with individual departments, which is really great, not just in the Boston area, but across Massachusetts. So that's something that you can refer your departments or officials to. Um, to make sure that they get registered, um, that they understand that this is a way that for a few hours of their time, and for a hundred to two hundred dollars, they can make the next version of our base code a really big leap forward. Yeah. And then I will briefly touch on the second facet of our Build It Better Building Codes campaign. So we want to make sure that we have a stronger floor, so a higher floor, but we also want to raise the ceiling of building code standards. Um, because like Darren explained, um, there really isn't going to be a difference when this next version of the code comes out between the base and the stretch code. And we've been hearing from our communities and chapters across the state that they want to do next year planning, but they're unable to require it under the current stretch code. <clears throat> so here you can see um, which communities in Massachusetts have adopted the stretch code, um, which is a vast majority of the state. But like we said, um, it's not really a stretch at this point. It doesn't really make a difference whether whether or not you've adopted the stretch code if the stretch code isn't an improvement from the base code. So what we're really hoping to fight for is a net zero stretch code. And this is um, something that we're working with Senator Comerford about, who is going to speak more in just a couple of minutes about this. Um, but basically, we filed an act to the term with Representative Tammy Gouveia from Acton um, to establish a net zero of stretch code. So this is a bill that would direct the BBRS, which is generally an anti-efficiency body, just to make that clear, um, to <laughs> actually develop and enforce a net zero of stretch code. 
And so next steps that you can take to get involved with our next year stretch code campaign are to engage in letter writing to the BBRS. Um, so something that we've had some folks do is submit letters from their select boards or energy committees telling the BBRS why their community needs a net zero stretch code now and why the current stretch code isn't enough of a stretch. And also CC and Governor Baker and Speaker DeLeo on these letters. Um, something else is to offer testimony in favor of net zero at the next upcoming um, public comment opportunity at the BBRS, which will be in May. Um, you can see me here with a few other net zero hero advocates. They have the stickers on. Um, <laughs> basically explaining why um, it's important to your community that you need to have an FDA or stretch code, um, not in 20 or 30 years, but actually now. Yeah. Yes. So thank you guys all so much. And I'll pass it over to Senator Trump. Just, just real quickly, on the voting, uh, it's all electronic voting. So you can vote from the comfort of your own home or your office. So you don't have to go. In the past, you used to have to go to the public action hearings in order to vote. And now it's all online. So, so that shouldn't be uh, a deterrent to, to voting. Progressive activist in Western Massachusetts, Senator Joe Comerford, is proudly serving her first term as a champion for the people of the Hampshire, Franklin, and Worcester District. Over the course of her career, Senator Comerford has fought for climate justice and is now working in the State House to fight climate change by making building codes stronger for everyone in Massachusetts. for that wonderful introduction. Uh, thank you to the Hitchcock Center for this hosting of this great event, and of course to MCAN and Mothers Out Front, um, and uh, everyone who is leading the work, uh, and of course Climate Action Now, leading the work here regionally and across, this, across the country. Um, so, you know, I think where I can pick up here is a little bit about how, in fact, the state senator in her first term was able to partner with this initiative, which is a groundswell. So very quickly, the Hampshire Franklin Worcester District is 24 cities and towns. So we're at the base of it, and it goes up the beautiful Connecticut River Valley to New Hampshire and Vermont that tees right to uh, Royalston and left to Colerain. Um, so, slide. So it, this moment right now started during the campaign. Right? It started when I met with a group of uh, Amherst folks who were leading the work for net zero. And the people in Amherst talked to me about the kind of imperative, the groundswell coming from this region. It started when I was at house party after house party or gathering, where it became really clear to me that if I wanted to work on behalf of this district, climate, which I was already, was already one of my top three, uh, issues, right? I, I always, it, if you heard me campaign, I campaign for education, health care, and the environment, for climate. Um, but it really became much more sharply focused uh, in deeper meetings with constituents. And then it became a mandate for my Senate team. So I hired a Senate team, one of whom, Ronnie Jacobson, actually has a great bench in environmental, uh, environmental science. And actually it was Ronnie who worked with MCAN to bring this bill in so that we could fight for it uh, as part of the bills that we introduced, our first slate of bills that we introduced. Um, and so when we were thinking about this and hearing from the people of Amherst and really wrestling with the fact that 20 out of 24 of my cities and towns are green communities already, we realized, and, and then also thinking about the kind of thwarted work that we've seen over sessions, we realized in our own team that this kind of environmental work has to be holistic. We have to look at environmental justice through an energy lens, through a building code lens, through an agriculture lens, and I'll, at the end I'll tell you a, bit, a tiny bit about the other bills that I've filed to give you a sense of the kind of ways that I'm gonna to try to approach this on your behalf. And the other is just that it's time. 
right? We recognize that it's time. That was another imperative that came. Yeah, oh, no, no, you can switch it right. Yeah, it's totally good. <laughs> so let me just talk to you about what this act does. So it's an act establishing a net zero stretch code. It's right now called SD2212. Um, that's a Senate docket number. That won't be the bill number. This, this is now with the Senate clerk. It will be given a bill number. It will be sent to a committee. In advance of today, as you probably, Rebecca probably imagines, I actually called the clerk and said, hey, I'm going to speak to my community. I'd really love to know what the bill number is, and I'd love to know what committee it's going to, uh, so that you know, they can be informed and take action. Uh, so we imagine, right, that it might be headed to TUE, but we don't know, actually. What I can tell you is that the bill uh, is very interesting, actually. The clerk is looking at the fact that this could perhaps go to a regional development. Uh, committee. This is interesting, I think, because, because, and this goes back to the idea of climate work being holistic, right, and one of the things I like best about this net zero stretch code is that it may not have to follow the same path it may. It may go to TUE, but it may not. And it just talks about the kind of 360 degree approach um, that you all are leading here, and MCAN is leading, in terms of trying to break out of uh, a traditional path for doing climate work. So it has to be fully implemented in green communities by 2030, and it has to be updated with every three years uh, in alignment with the international standards that we heard about. Uh, and that's a great thing. So sometimes in the legislature, as you know, uh, legislation can be passed which is static, meaning it gets passed and we're all really happy, but in 10 years, it's already old. Um, so this is one of the really good things, I think, about the leadership that we've heard in terms of the creation of this bill. Um, and then the other thing that I just want to really pull out is the environmental justice focus. Uh, and I'm going to read here because I think it's really important. Deval Patrick helped crystallize a focus on environmental justice, which I think is extraordinarily important. So it, this bill you know, really calls us forward to knowing that environmental justice has to be intrinsic to this process. So before establishing any code or update, two public meetings must be held in EJ communities. Um, and, and so uh, Governor Patrick defined environmental justice communities as discrete and identifiable communities, mostly lower income and or of color, that are at risk of being disproportionately and negatively affected or impacted by environmental policies and overburdened by higher density of known contaminated sites uh, and by air and water or water pollution. So I really love the fact that th these communities, these EJ communities, are going to be at the center of understanding how we can do this best. And then it offers a phase-in structure. So one of the things that uh, I learned from the Amherst, our Amherst folks, was that in fact it took a lot of work for Amherst to identify this, the net zero approach. And it, was, it just didn't happen out of air. They had to build capacity. They're recognizing that, in fact, they have to find the experts that are going to make these buildings themselves more expert in the buildings to create the buildings. This actually helps incentivize that kind of teaching in those communities. So uh, I was uh, very fortunate to be put on a Senate committee uh, that's going to look at climate change, but I don't think that I need to tell anybody in this room about what's needed. Uh, in terms of moving the legislature. So last year, the same Senate committee put out a bill that was not passed uh, by the time it was um, married with House, um, House uh, priorities, um, which were not the priorities of the Senate. So what it's going to take in order for us to get this bill through and any other piece of climate legislation is the kind of people's movement that we've seen thanks to Climate Action Now, thanks to Mothers Out Front regionally, and certainly thanks statewide to MCAN and allies. It's going to take that kind of that kind of people's movement to get this done. Um, the barriers facing the legislature, I think, are known, but the emerging opportunities, and I'm sure you're paying attention to these too, uh, we are seeing for the first time people like Bob DeLeo offering, and he just did, a billion dollars. He wants to throw down on a billion dollars over 10 years um, for local initiatives. That didn't, of course, happen out of uh, the goodness of Speaker DeLeo's heart. Right? <laughs> but, you know, it, it happened because people's movements are making the legislature pay attention to this. It's happening because people on this panel who have been leaders here are call and people in this 
in, your, in this audience who have been leaders here are holding the legislature accountable. That's what it's going to take. Um, and we probably, you're also probably following the fact that Governor Baker um, is talking for the first time about a REGI, which is a regional agreement around transportation. Uh, because as the speakers have said, right, one of the big, one of the big emitters of carbon is of course the buildings, right, housing and buildings, but of course transportation is another biggie, both of consuming energy and emitting carbon. So there's some real emergent opportunities here that I think as we go into this session, we have to maximize. And of course, we're all operating under the umbrella of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's Green New Deal. And there are, yeah, which you know, we all should whoop about, right? And um, <laughs> Senator Markey came on board. This is, again, this is not out of any kind of chance. This is a people's movement, electing people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and then holding people like Ed Markey to a higher standard, right? So he's, he's, he's responding to the kind of energy that's coming from the grassroots. Um, so the role of communities and constituents. Um, so the communities have to be a foundation to this. Um, it's going to be a foundation across the Commonwealth, um, and it's going to be. It was certainly a foundation for me in terms of picking up the kind of gold standard that activists have been using um, locally for some time. Um, and it's going to take holding state legislators accountable. Uh, so what does that look like? In addition to actually testifying at uh, national and or state hearings, it's going to take us networking here in this region with other members of the uh, with constituents who um, have other members of the legislature. It's going to take a hearing um, or many hearings, both in this district uh, and in the state house, to make sure that the people's voices, people's most affected by this, will be at the center. So if people like me will help make that happen. Um, and people like Rep. Dom, Rep. Dom is a, a state rep, rep for this district who signed on to this uh, piece of legislation. She couldn't be here today, but I have to imagine that she was inspired, as, as inspired as I was, by the activists in, in Amherst about net zero. So the next steps. Um, this was filed in both the House and the Senate, as folks said. Uh, Temi Guvea uh, and I filed, so Temi Guvea is a state rep. Um, she is quite on fire about this. She and I also have another bill. We're partnering on another bill, actually having to do with the opioid crisis. Um, so we are tightly linked. Yeah, it's a good bill, too. It's pretty gutsy. It's a, she's a gutsy legislator, uh, and she's about as whip smart as you can possibly imagine. Um, so uh, we're filed in both the House and the Senate. That was MCAN's good advocacy, actually. Um, it'll go to a committee, and that's, of course, where the advocacy will begin. I would add, including um, Speaker DeLeo, to what Rebecca said, and uh, the governor, that you should also <coughs> contact the Senate President, as well as making so Senate President Karen Spilka, who cares also a great deal about uh, climate and climate change, and is also, in addition to um, Speaker DeLeo, although she didn't throw down a billion dollars, but she has made it clear that she wants to see climate priorities uh, front and center. Um, but I, so I think you know, your advocacy with her would be, I, I think, warmly welcome, honestly, as she gets her feet under her. Um, so it'll go through committees. Um, we'll hear from advocates here in the district and in Boston. And then there'll be a period of possible amendments. It might get put into another set of bills. It could get refined based on what advocates are seeing in terms of opportunities. Um, and then, you know, uh, if our advocacy and our um, sharp work inside the building in terms of networking and really urging our, um, our colleagues forward, it'll come uh, to the floor. Um, and that's our hope, right? Our hope is that this will get out of committee um, and it will get voted on. And we will have a, a vote where we can actually hold lawmakers accountable for their vote. Um, so this is how to get me. Uh, that's my email address. Um, you can also, if you, if you want to track this bill, you can make a My Legislature <coughs> account, um, and you can star the bills that you're interested in. Um, I want to just shout out to Elena Cohen. Elena is uh, district director for this area, uh, for the region, and she's just fabulous. Elena and I are in the district quite a lot. Elena's here more than I am. I'm in Boston most Tuesdays through Thursdays, uh, although I go back and forth sometimes. Um, but Elena's here, we work for you. 
Um, we work for the people, the 160,000 people in our Hampshire, Franklin, Worcester district. Um, and here's a shameless plug for these other pieces of legislation that I have, um, just so that you understand that I see this and the opportunity to work with MCAM, uh, MCAN in this larger climate, climate justice work that I really feel like you're calling me to do. Um, so I have a couple of other bills that are, um, that are actually protect public interest around gas and gas infrastructure. They protect ratepayers, and there's one about grid modernization. And it really looks at the kind of interconnectivity issues that are being forced upon uh, communities like Wendell, for example. So we call that one the Wendell Bill. And the kind of advocacy that we saw in Wendell was similarly inspiring to Amherst. Um, I also have filed a study for rail along Route 2 uh, because of the connection between building and transportation. So uh, to restart passenger rail along Route 2. And I have a bill called the Healthy Soils Bill, which looks at the role of soil and no and low-till soil um, to sequester carbon. And it actually looks at, at the ways that farmers in our region can get the kind of technical assistance that we're talking about here, needing here in terms of net zero, energy and code. Um, the different sector, but the same idea. So it's a job creator and a climate bill all in one. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Senator Comerford. That was so great. Um, so now we have about 15 minutes to do a little bit of Q&A before we do some breakout groups. Um, yes. So I'll start. So, so okay. Hi. So if you are in a community that has adopted the stretch code, should you be worrying about IECC? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't worry too much. Don't, don't stay up at night. <laughs> no, for sure. You know, it's going to leave the green communities, the green community communities, without really a clear direction. And we hear a lot of rumbling out there from various municipalities throughout the state that they're going to look to use their home rule, their zoning powers, to create their own code. Uh, so we want to work with them to you know, transfer that energy uh, into bills like Joe and to convince the BBRS that you know, we, we've got to see something quicker than a year's time uh, on, on the stretch code. And preferably we'd like to see the zero energy code, uh, but some sort of other type of stretch code might be as well as an interim step. But yeah, so there's certainly definitely a, a worry. There's a worry among the builders and the home energy raters and everyone all mass save folks, everyone that has some part of the green communities, whether it be on the incentive side or the regulatory side. Thank you. I saw the, um, the population limits, like uh, some towns can have four uh, representatives, some can have eight. If you're working to try and get a town to send somebody, but you can only find one, is there a minimum? Can one person go from a, a town or city? I can answer this, so the answer is yes. Um, and in the past, it's often been the case that only one person has registered. So like the building department will register, but only one building inspector will vote. Okay. Um, but what we're encouraging folks to do for efficiency folks, um, is to try and maximize the number of votes. Um, so definitely we want to be filling up those rosters, but it's also possible for say the town of Amherst to register as an entity and then have multiple officials that work for different departments uh, to partner up so that there's basically the maximum number of votes possible. Hi, I have a follow-up question. Um, I'm on the Energy Committee in Montague and um, I do. <laughs> um, and uh, so I'm wondering, it sounds, I'm just trying to clarify which entities could, could do these votes? Uh, so we've got the select board, we've got the energy committee, which is not a commission, it's a committee, but we are, we were, we, we are um, uh, appointed by the select board. Um, we have the inspectors, so, you know, I'm not, of, of course, if the town stands behind this, the more the merrier, but uh, I just want to be clear on how we can advocate for this. Um, 
I'm not sure about the, the committee for the person the commission. I'm pretty sure the select board, if, if you have one, is, is the right entity that they would be allowed to vote. And then the city council or town council. And then, of course, different departments uh, within your city government. Yeah, and just to elaborate a little bit, so it is on a case-by-case -case basis a lot of the time. Um, so the International Code Council looks at every single entity that applies um, for membership and then decides on that individual basis. But there really isn't a limit um, as to how many entities can get registered. And something exciting that we found out that even if the committee isn't on, if members of the committee aren't being paid by the town, but they're on a committee that was chartered by the town, um, that they are eligible voters to vote on the code. So that is a big victory for, for us and for efficiency. So. so you could have people voting from the, from the select board, from different departments, from the energy committee. Yes. So all of those could have up to four votes in our case because exactly. of our population. Yeah. Each of those. Each yeah. of each. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have a question about um, the mm -hmm. codes and the regulations that are more an IDCC geared towards new construction. You mentioned there and that there's nothing for existing buildings. I mean, looking at the fact that most buildings are existing, mm -hmm. and especially Massachusetts, are approaching one, two, three hundred, uh, one hundred years old. 40, 50, 60 years old, where we have lousy construction. Is there any movement to have uh, renovations starting to meet the current code? Because there <coughs> seems to be a huge amount of buildings that are in the foreseeable future going to be using a lot of energy unless that has changed. Yeah, so in, in the course of my presentation, I mentioned that there's no provision in the stretch code for existing buildings. But on, in the within the national code, there is an existing building code, and there is an existing building uh, provisions within the energy code and a number of the other codes as well. Uh, usually what triggers it, from, and it depends on state to state, is the amount of square footage uh, that is being uh, addressed or in, in within the building, or the depth of what is being done in the building. So if you are, uh, taking down a wall and putting up a new wall, then that would have to be built to the new code. Uh, but if you're just opening the wall or replacing sheetrock, you don't have to address the energy efficiency. So it depends what you're doing. Uh, there's certain uh, duck runs, uh, you know, the length of the run, that would trigger whether or not it has to be uh, built to the new code. Uh, with, for the 2021 IECC, uh, there are a number of proposals. There's actually a proposal to uh, make just an existing building code, a standalone existing building code uh, for, uh, for existing buildings. So but, we'll see that. but to follow up on that, I think it should be more specific because the stretch code is what most municipalities in Massachusetts now follow. Yeah. And that is not including existing buildings. So we're actually, most of the construction that's happening that's in renovation is not meeting today's, you know, is not meeting IECC because you don't have to on the stretch code. Yeah, I mean, anything you would, you would still have to, even under the stretch code, it doesn't, it doesn't, you don't have to go beyond the base code on, if you're a green community for existing buildings. So you still have to address whatever is in the base code for the existing building. Well, but you wouldn't have to go further. Right. right. I just wanted to add, so for example, our green building ordinance in Cambridge applies to new buildings and major renovation over 25,000 square feet. So it is based on, on size. And of course, you know, if the building's not being renovated, then we can't really right. touch it. So, right. so it has to be tight. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, I was interested that you talked about residential uh, 212 to 215, hardly any evidence of uh, better or, or more um, efficient. I, I do all these states, I remember you said West Virginia and then up through um, Massachusetts, or Maine, have uh, energy audits like our Mass Save, which I thought were supposed to have made a real difference. 
um, in recent years. I guess I knew there. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, so most states do have some sort of uh, energy efficiency incentive program. It's certainly stronger in, in some states than in others. So uh, New Jersey, Massachusetts is extremely strong incentive programs. Uh, Connecticut has uh, one of the strongest uh, incentive programs for zero energy buildings actually in the country. Uh, but then there's other states like Maine and New Hampshire that aren't Robust. I mean more home energy audits. Home energy? I thought they made a big difference in this state. In Massachusetts, certainly, yeah. Home energy audits are very robust in, in Massachusetts and as well as in other states. Um, it's not home. robust in New Hampshire, Vermont, or, Man or Maine. Yeah, that is right. Yes. Not a system. Right. Yeah. Where it's just another way. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, and actually, you know, there was a, a legislation that, that was being heard in Massachusetts in the last session that would have required a home energy rating of <coughs> all homes upon uh, resale. Uh, so that would go a long way to to uh, incentivizing the, the home uh, home uh, retrofit and uh, inspection. If, if I could revert to the International Code Council and voting membership, can we go to the website for the International Code Council and find out who is eligible to vote? Um, so the definition that was on the slide is based on, it's directly from there, the definition from the ICC website. Is that your question or do you mean can I go to the website and find out whether our town manager in Amherst is eligible to vote? Yeah, so your town manager in Amherst is eligible to vote because of all town managers, um, because they're appointed by the city are, are eligible. Yes. And also, and, and, I, and yeah. not, not only eligible, but um, it's if actually it's registered. Oh, it's registered. Okay, yeah. yeah. So we do have a list of folks that registered for the last code cycle um, that we're sort of giving out on a town by town basis. So I could let you know who registered um, in Amherst or Northampton. Um, I don't believe your town manager registered, but we can double check that. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Yes. And also, I'm just going to say that we're also we worked with um, City Councilor Matt O'Malley in Boston to put together a tutorial video on how uh, to register to actually vote on with the ICC because it's sort of a, a strange process, um, but it, it's pretty it's pretty simple once you know the steps. So that's something that will be circulating afterwards uh, to pass on to your officials and say like these are the five steps you can take uh, to register to vote. Thank you. Oh, where do you start? Um, a lot of questions recently about existing buildings, and in our town, in the last five or ten years, I suspect we have built a few new homes total. That's mm -hmm. it. So, right. so dealing with new homes is not helpful. I mean, it's just like these earlier questions. Um, it, it, Quentin, in your talk, you talked about replacing fossil fuels with low carbon fuels. And I'm wondering what you mean by low carbon fuels. And the reason I ask is that recently, in the last four years, there's been a lot of work to classify burning wood as being a clean, low carbon fuel. Amherst just got a million dollars to build a wood chip facility. Um, and, and these are, these are you know, uh, Ashfield got money, uh, Dalton got money, and the, the pressure on switching your heat to wood chips, which are now being subsidized through the APS, is huge. And there are companies out here that are driving this and <laughs> making profit from this, and and Governor it's Baker is considering this a real economic boom to the region. And I don't know how we fight this. Just a little plug on Thursday this week, uh, Mary Booth uh, <coughs> is going to be speaking about biomass specifically here. If anyone wants to know more about biomass, particularly Thursday at seven. Um, so I, I'm not going to wade into the biomass controversy, but um, <coughs> we've, we've lost 20% of our tree canopy in Cambridge over the last decade. So 
so we're, we're not going to be learning one key. Um, the school that I mentioned has a biodiesel backup generator, and biodiesel that we use is recovered from uh, cooking oil. Um, most of the heat, uh, heating and cooling is through geothermal wells that are drilled in the sports fields behind the school. And then it's supplemented uh, when necessary with air source heat pumps. So, you know, I think between those two technologies, you can, you can have uh, very efficient buildings that are not consuming fossil fuel. We, we do need a backup generator in case the power goes out. And then, of course, the school is, is plastered with, with solar panels. So, uh, just so quickly, yeah, existing buildings is kind of the holy grail right now. It's <coughs> like, yeah, we've pushed new construction as far as we can, you know, essentially. You know, so now, like, if you look at California on the new building side, they're requiring PV, they're requiring uh, battery backup storage, so that's sort of the next generation. The existing buildings we have now need to become grid assets. They need to become elect all electrified and electrify the whole grid so we can get to that zero carbon. But, so that's where the emphasis is for the majority of the energy advocates right now is on existing buildings. And I think we'll see you know, real leaps in the next few years on you know, just, just in the, the existing building within the, the grid infrastructure. Um, one of the things that I'm working on in, in Cambridge, so we did a community choice aggregation program, and I believe a lot of towns are, are working on similar things. And we're trying to push the envelope beyond RECs, uh, renewable energy certificates. So what I'm proposing is that we actually capture a difference between the cost that, that we're charged for electricity, which is quite a bit below Eversource because we can do long-term contracts, and capture that difference and put it into a fund that we then use for energy efficiency projects in existing buildings. Um, because you know, I, I don't think you're going to get to the existing buildings primarily through the codes. I think you really have 